In this episode of Stories and Sips, we're talking about dolphins and distilleries. That can only mean one thing. We're talking about one of the most westerly towns in Europe, the remote, the insane, the magical town of Dingle in County Kerry, or to the Irish speakers amongst you, on Dangan e Gunte Kiri. I'm Barry Chandler, an Irishman in Ohio, on a mission to introduce more and more Americans to the tastes and tales of Irish whiskey. Welcome to episode number 10 of Stories and Sips. We have inexplicably made it to double digits, which I am thrilled about. And I want to firstly thank you for your support, for your comments, for your likes and subscriptions, and for helping me with content and ideas as I put these stories out into the world. And if I was to identify one highlight for me really since starting these stories, it's the friendships, the contacts I've made online with those in the whiskey business and those passionate about a drop of lovely brown water. Here's to meeting many of you very, very soon. Now you might have noticed a new backdrop in this episode. What you're seeing behind me is a Giles Norman photograph that I bought in Kinsale uh, about seven years ago and it survived four different house moves across America to California and back to Ohio again. And the subject of this photograph is of course the subject of today's story, the story of Dingle. And to celebrate 10 episodes of Stories and Sips, I'm gonna do something that you don't see done very often. I'm going to open a bottle of Dingle single malt whiskey on the air. And I'm going to drink it. I'm not going to hoard it or store it. I am going to taste this lovely drop of single malt whiskey. Beautiful colour in it. Nice generous pour. This is going to be joining me on today's episode. Mm. That's lovely. So, to many Irish people, the town of Dingle, a relatively remote outpost on the Dingle Peninsula, as you can see behind me, in southwest Ireland, it's synonymous with one thing a dolphin. Now first sighted in 1984 in the harbour, Fungi, as he has been named by the local fishermen, a male bottlenose dolphin, has been the famous resident of Dingle for almost 30, 35 years now. And he's drawn crowds of tourists to the small fishing town, all hoping to get a rare glance of a dolphin in his natural habitat. Now, I'm not sure if it's still the same today, but when I first went to Dingle 15 years ago, I took one of, the, one of those uh, sightseeing boats out to see him. And in a lovely gesture of Irish hospitality, the skipper said he wouldn't take my money unless we actually got to see Fungi. Now, I get the feeling that a sighting is a near guarantee or they wouldn't be making such a promise. There are no fools in Kerry. Now, so famous has Fungi become in the town, there's a statue of him right in the centre of the town. A gesture of thanks to a creature that has brought so much tourism and so much joy to the town. Now, amazingly, Fungi has been doing the business in Dingle for almost 35 years, leading some to speculate that the smart people of Dingle had the aging dolphin replaced years ago with a robot that's guaranteed to draw the crowds rain, hail or snow. But of course, Dingle is more than a dolphin. It's one of the most beautiful, most scenic, most Irish of locations. With hills running down to the harbour, a coastline along the peninsula captured in this shot here behind me, and small, windy, colourful streets that surely represent the tourist impression of what real Ireland is and certainly was. Now it's a town of about 2,000 people and 50 pubs, a great ratio in my opinion, and many of these pubs serve a dual purpose. Pubs like Foxy John's where you walk in the door and on the right hand side you can buy a tyre or a hammer or a box of nails or a fishing rod and then turn to your left for a small whiskey and a, and a pint. And you've got Dick Max where you can have a pint while your belt is being made or a leather keyring is being cut for you. And in another pub they used to make coffins out the back while you supped your pint in the front. It's old Ireland at its best. Today in Dingle, while Fungi still draws the crowds, the town is arguably more famous for a pleasure of the liquid variety. You see, just six short years ago, an old sawmill on the outskirts of the town was converted into the most exciting new development in the world of Irish spirits, the Dingle Distillery, which was the first new purpose-built distillery built on the island of Ireland in over 200 years, and at the time, the only one Irish owned. The distillery was founded by the late Oliver Hughes, founder of the Porterhouse Brewing Company, his cousin Liam Lahart, and Peter Mosley, who saw an opportunity to create artisanal brands of whiskey, vodka and gin 
against a backdrop of large multinational companies who control the Irish spirits market until then. Now their first venture with a distillery came to my attention back in 2012 when they earned global press for their novel approach to fundraising for the cost of building the distillery and sustaining it for the years needed while the whiskey matured. They created a program called the Founding Fathers, whereby anybody could buy their own cask of whiskey and with it, a piece of Irish distilling history and in turn, funding the development of the distillery. 500 people did, giving the distillery the funds needed to begin production. Now here's where I insert my own note of bitterness. Bitterness not at the fact that they sold out the program and that 500 people have their names on casks maturing nicely in Dingle, but that my name is not on one of them. And it's not for lack of trying. You see, as soon as that story broke, I hastily emailed my friends asking them to join me and create a syndicate to buy a barrel. I emailed Dingle, uh, the distillery, and they approved of a group of us buying in. But six years ago, American interest in Irish whiskey was not what it is today, and unfortunately, I got no bites. Unable to afford the purchase, myself, I then had to write back to Dingle, declining the investment. And what an investment it would have been, with bottles of Dingle today achieving hundreds and hundreds of dollars at auction and in private sale groups online. Such is the demand for the spirit. So, on to the spirit itself. Now, while the bulk of the production in Dingle is gin and vodka today, it's the whiskey that we're most interested in. At least I am anyway. So far, they've produced a number of batches of single malt whiskey, and they're about to release their second batch of pot still whiskey now before the end of the year. Now, because production of the whiskey is so limited, as few as two barrels a day are produced, and the fact that this was the first new distillery in Ireland to distill their own spirits from scratch, not sourcing distillate from other distilleries, demand for the product has been absolutely extraordinary. Now, it's not unusual to see bottles of their first batch of cask strength single malt being sold online for six or seven hundred dollars. And that's a far cry from the 60 or 70 it initially retailed at. Now, when I asked online earlier this week for ideas on what I should include in my story of Dingle, I heard one thing over and over again. Barry, tell them about the welcoming community. Now, maybe a sense of community is something completely natural to the people of Dingle, and maybe they don't know any other way other than to welcome you into theirs. But that's not something you find in all parts of the world, I think you'd agree. One of the founding fathers of the distillery, a proud owner of a cask that's aging nicely in the warehouse with his name on it, shared with me how when he went back to Dingle to visit in 2015, he was able to volunteer cutting limes for the gin and vodka tastings. They even allowed him to bottle a few gins and vodkas on the line. He shoveled hot grain from the, the mash tun. And then afterwards, he headed off to have a pint with the lads. I mean, what a vivid picture he painted. And I've taken many distillery tours in many parts of the world, but I've never had a distillery tour like I had in Dingle. For those of you familiar with the place, you might agree with me that it's hardly a large building and it could be walked in five or 10 minutes. But last year when my wife and I visited in January, we settled in for the day. After touring our small group of four or five uh, around the distillery, Joe, our tour guide, who you may be familiar with if you've been there, who is a retired Irish policeman or a Garda, and had spent most of his life in Dingle, he sat us down for our tasting. Uh, because of the success of their whiskey and its demand around the world, he told us that we were only going to be able to taste the vodka and the gin. However, after a few sips of those, the others in our group left, and it was just Joe, Melinda, and I left upstairs. Picking up on her American accent, he had questions and thoughts about American politics and life and the world and love and all the things that are important to debate on a rainy January afternoon. Maybe recognizing that we were good for the crack and there were no more tours that afternoon, he glanced around with the look of a man that's about to suggest something he shouldn't. And he said, I'm sure I could find a bottle of whiskey if I look hard enough. Well, he slipped away and came back half a minute later with a half bottle of cask strength whiskey, which uh, must be on standby for celebrating occasions such as a rainy January day. Well, we stayed and talked and sipped for hours and we still talk about it and we still tell people about it. It was nothing to do with the whiskey really. It was that we felt that we were welcome and part of the small little distillery community, if only for an afternoon. That's this sense of community that we're, or that we're all in this together, that's evident all over the town of Dingle. Every bar, every restaurant proudly carries the whiskey, the gin, the vodka, and they have signs outside their doors advertising the fact. They speak with reverence of the three men who took a gamble and a chance and have in a short period of time created something magical and valuable in Dingle. 
It's given employment to the locals and it ships bottles of local pride all over the world. In turn, inviting those who drink a product with Dingle on the label back to the little town to see from whence it came. The development of the Dingle distillery has for me highlighted the best of what it means to be Irish. I see no big grudgery, no naysaying as can be occasionally evident in Irish life, but instead I see encouragement, well-wishing and support for something that many see as being the start of a renaissance in artisanal Irish whiskey production. Nowhere is this support more evident than in the maturation warehouse where there sits a barrel with an iconic name on it, that of Middleton Distillery. The giant of Irish whiskey making has recognized the importance of Dingle, the importance of small batch, independent whiskey making, the importance of having diversity and choice, and they bought a barrel to show that they mean it. Jameson and the Irish Distillers Company have certainly created global demand for our incredible whiskies. And of course, Irish Distillers is owned by Perno Ricard, a company that turned over 9 billion euros in 2017. What a daunting prospect it must be to look at the market leader and their deep pockets and their global reach and their history and say, I think we can have a go at that too. That's what the founders of Dingle Distillery did. In 1954, Roger Bannister was the first man in history to break the four minute mile. It was considered impossible. 46 days later, his record was broken. And a year later, three runners in a single race broke the four minute mile time because they now knew it was possible. Dingle Distillery has shown what is possible when chances are taken, when a commitment to a dream is pursued and standing on the shoulders of giants has inspired a new generation of distillers and blenders to take Irish whiskey to the next level all around the world. In Ireland, we now have almost 20 new distilleries in some stage of production today. To think that six short years ago, that distillery in Dingle was an empty sawmill, and today it's doing what Ireland does best. It's punching above its weight, and it's creating a global conversation. Over the next few years, demand for Dingle whiskey will no doubt force an expansion of facilities. There's talk of a purpose-built visitor center and a promise of some great whiskies to come. So the Dingle distillery is only the beginning, and you'd be foolish to ignore it. Nobody ever got rich betting against Kerry men and women. Someone on Twitter this week told me that while it was hard to get to Dingle, it was even harder to leave. Which begs the question, why would you even want to? So to my American friends, the Ireland you've been looking for is right there in Dingle. Book your flights, or better yet, send me a message and we'll all go together. So to Oliver Hughes and his co-founders, to Joe and the team at Dingle Distillery, to the welcoming community in Dingle, I can't wait to get back to Dingle and the distillery, and this time, maybe I won't leave either. Slauncha. If you liked this episode, Enter Why Wouldn't You? Isn't It About Whiskey? Please subscribe so that I can foist my opinions upon you and slowly, subliminally, and successfully convert you to the joys of Irish whiskey. You can subscribe to this episode on iTunes, SoundCloud, and wherever you get your podcasts by simply searching for Stories and Sips. And of course, you can see every episode in full Technicolor by subscribing on YouTube. And if you know a friend who might like Stories and Sips, then be a good friend to them and forward them a link so that they too can be converted to the Irish Nectar. Sláinte.